As you watch this teaching, please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see. Welcome to Home Group. My name is Rick Renner, and tonight we're going to return to learning how to be in the right place at the right time. And tonight you're going to find out that sometimes God puts you in places that you would have never chosen yourself because you need that environment to prepare you for what's ahead of you. God put the Apostle Paul in the right place at the right time. It was not an environment he would have chosen, but it's what he needed and it prepared him for the next phase. But I'm here tonight with Sister Denise Renner and Brother Paul Renner and Brother Joel Renner. Welcome, brethren, to the program. (laughs) Thank you. Thank Thank you, Brother Renner. Thank you. (laughs) And welcome, home group. I think that we're all going to find ourselves somewhere in this teaching tonight because probably you've been in some place uncomfortable but God was doing something great in your life. Hey, man. Paul? I come to Home Group prepared to learn. Every time we come join here, every time you join, I hope you also come prepared to learn. But also, Home Group is kind of a vulnerable place because we comment and we talk and we speak to each other and we're learning from each other at the same time. So please also comment. Is there something you like? Let us know. If there's something you don't like, let us know. If okay. there's something you'd like to share, please share. Write us your prayer request, and we will pray for you. But you can also pray for each other. Paul, you know what I liked about yesterday's home group? The Antioch was a 15 days trip from Jerusalem. It was. It was 300 miles. And the average human walks 20 miles a day. That's what they can walk. But it's about 15 days trip from Jerusalem. And, Dad, you were saying yesterday that the church in Jerusalem got a little stuck in their ways and they got a little just stuck where they were but god was doing miracles and just amazing things in antioch and i think it's very interesting that the the church in jerusalem had to send barnabas to antioch to to see you know what there what was going on over there because they were having amazing things happening and i just think it's a very interesting that sometimes you need to get out of your location to go somewhere else to see what god's doing so that you can change yourselves so that is excellent Mm -hmm. We Christians often travel to Jerusalem to see the place of Jesus's ministry and Golgotha and the Temple Mount and all these other wonderful things in Jerusalem. But when me and my father were in Antioch a little while ago, we should be going to Antioch too, because that's where Believers in Christ were first called Christians. That's where Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, served in a church there and grew. And he was always a member there. And every time that he needed to give a spiritual report, he went back to Antioch. It he was his home church. Back to Antioch. He did. He traveled there several times and reported back to heaven. So when I was there, I thought, why don't we go to Antioch? Now, I know why we don't go to Antioch. It's kind of out of the way, and it's really not the center of the world. But I I know why we don't go there, but I think it should get more attention. Well, it's really hard to get there, but it's quite an amazing place. There's a lot of things to see in Antioch, and it seems the gospel came to Antioch possibly as early as the year 37. I mean, that is really early, right after the stoning of Stephen. The believers were scattered, and Peter went north. And he preached to the Jews, so it started as a Jewish church. But by the time that you get to Acts chapter 11 and Acts chapter 13, it is a Gentile church and a Jewish church combined. Wow. Anyway, it was the right place and the right time for the Apostle Paul. And that's what we're teaching this week. Being in the right place at the right time. This is a free download at renner.org. Just go there. You can download it right now. And we're offering you the whole series which I'm teaching in my regular TV program. It's five parts. And the stand-ups to all of these programs are really, they're at that site in Antioch. Mm-hmm. It's, I mean, it's worth the whole series just to see where all this took place. It yes. is amazing. Beautiful view from where the church was. Oh, it's magnificent. But Paul, when you're there and you realize what a foul spiritual environment it was and the church just thrived there. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't matter what the devil does. The church is going to be all right. Amen. Well, if we're talking about being in the right place at the right time, historians say that the church began to grow in Antioch significantly after an earthquake. Yes, that's right. Now, 
it doesn't sound like being in the right place at the right time for an earthquake. Wouldn't you just love it if the Lord removed you for the time of the earthquake? But the church began to thrive right after the earthquake. Thing. You know why? Because there was such need. And the church really thrived after the big earthquake that took place in Antioch. It began to grow. They brought healing power. They were very well known for ministering to the people that had lost their homes. You know, God is an opportunist. God knows how to use every opportunity to get the gospel to people. We need to keep our eyes wide open. And when tragedy happens, we need to say, God, how are we supposed to use this one for the gospel? Mm -hmm. But we're also op offering you my book called The Will of God, The Key to Your Success. And today I'm going to read just a little bit more from this. Is that okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. But let's go back to Acts chapter 13, verse 1. And our subject tonight really is being in the right place at the right time. God put the Apostle Paul in Antioch. He would have never naturally chosen Antioch. I mean, this was not the place where his flesh would have gravitated toward. He was a Jew. He was raised as a Jew. He was trained as a Jew. He was trained as a Jew and a very religious Jew not to have anything to do with Gentiles. In fact, the very, very, very religiously trained Jews believed the only purpose of a Gentile was to have one who stood outside the door of your house to wash your feet before you walked in the house. That was about their only contact with Gentiles. And now God was going to put this man who didn't even like Gentiles in a church dominated by a lot of Gentiles. Well, you know what? He was called to be the apostle to the Gentiles. If you're going to minister to Gentiles, you got to know something about Gentiles. It was a very uncomfortable place for him. And his flesh may have gravitated toward Jerusalem where there were Jews who thought like him. They looked like him. They had skin like him. They had hair like him. They had noses like his. They spoke the same language that he spoke. They thought the same. Culturally, they were the same. But he wouldn't have learned anything about Gentiles in Jerusalem. Wouldn't have learned a thing. It would not have prepared him for his future. He may have enjoyed being with people who looked like him, talked like him, trained like him, the same culture as him. He may have been comfortable there. But the will of God led him not there, but to a very uncomfortable environment in Antioch. Sometimes people say, God will never lead you where you're not comfortable. Excuse me, what? Just study the Bible. And you find most people were called by God to do things they would have never naturally done. Mm -hmm. When you step out of your ability, that's where you find God's ability. Mm -hmm. That's where God shows up. I think about my own life. You know, when I was in high school, I was bound and determined that I was going to go to ORU, Oral Roberts University. Even as a high school student, I took one class at ORU to get ready to go to ORU, to kind of get a jump start, start on my education. And one day the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, I forbid you to go to ORU. I said, what? ORU is a place for me. It's got people like me, people filled with the Spirit, speaking tongues, a theology department that's filled with Spirit-filled professors. I want to go to ORU. And the Holy Spirit said, you can go there if you want to, but that's not my plan for your life. Hmm. I want you to go to a secular university because I've got things for you there that will prepare you for your future that you will never get at ORU. Well, nothing against ORU. I love it. That's where I wanted to go. It is still an awesome school. It is the best. But the will of God led me somewhere else. And in that somewhere else, the secular university, I learned Greek on a level that I probably would not have learned it at another school. I learned to rub elbows with unbelievers and with intelligent people. We call them intelligentsia in Russia, professors that were anti-God. I needed that training. I learned how to defend my faith. I met Denise. I learned how to move in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. When you're in the right place, there really is a right place. God gives you what you need for your future. But the will of God led me somewhere I would have never chosen. Hey, we're sitting in Russia tonight. We're sitting in Russia. We would have never chosen this. That's where the will of God led us. We thought we were going to have a ministry in America and be there all of our life. And God said, no, I've got other plans for you. Moved our family to Russia. Here we are, not Russia, to the Soviet Union. 
Who would have ever naturally chosen that? That's where the will of God led us. It was the right place. It was the right time. And you guys, from this location, God has done amazing things we would have never experienced if we had just stayed in the United States. Denise? It's so important that we hear him and that we obey. And uh, as, as Rick was saying about where to go to school, that was the same, absolutely the same story for me. The Lord forbid me from going to ORU. And I thought, I don't understand that. And then, uh, but I disobeyed the Lord and I went to another university. But the Lord did not let up on trying to get me to the right place. Mm. And he dealt with me at the other school that I went chose and, and was in disobedience and brought me to the right place. Amen. I'm thinking about a Bible verse that says, obedience is better than sacrifice. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's the truth. And one obedience will lead you to the next step of obedience to the next step. Yeah. And I'm thinking about your example, Dad. You know, when you went to ORU, you, you, didn't, know you, were, you didn't know you were going to be mom there. Uh, no, I didn't. Not, not at ORU. Secular University. Yes, yes, I'm sorry. And... You didn't know that was that you were going to meet mom there. And the next step of obedience, you didn't know that what the next step would, would, would take you to. But it's a fact that when you're obedient with one thing, you're going to get another job to do. And if you're obedient there, you'll get the next job to do. And it's the same thing in your life. You know, it doesn't take a lot to change your life. Just one step of, in the right direction mm. can make a huge difference. That's awesome. That's great. Well, I want to read to you from this book, The Will of God, The Key to Your Success, about what Paul got in Antioch that he would not have gotten in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, everybody looked the same, had the same kind of hair, the same kind of nose, the same kind of skin color. They wore the same kind of clothes. They were all the same because they were all Jewish. But listen to what was in Antioch. Listen to this. Are you guys listening? Mm -hmm. In Antioch, blacks, whites, Jews, Gentiles all mingled together in leadership and worship. This is something that had never existed before. God used the plethora of nationalities and cultures in the congregation there to give Saul a broad perspective of the gospel and its mission to paint a powerful picture of what the church should look like. Mm. A colorful tapestry of people from all walks of life, through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, God was creating a new man, the body of Christ. The walls separating Jews and Gentiles had been broken down and destroyed, and Paul saw with his own eyes the reality that salvation was equally available to all. He lived and breathed this truth every day as he rubbed elbows with people from different cultures who were saved and filled with the Holy Ghost just like him. Think what a radical shift in thinking this was for him as a Hebrew of the Hebrews, circumcised on the eighth day, which means he was raised in a very religious family. He was worshiping and working side by side with uncircumcised people from different ethnic groups and backgrounds who had made Jesus Christ their Lord and their Savior. And he saw with his own eyes the power of God working in and through people from all nations. How could he argue with a Greek being saved? He saw it. How could he argue with an African being a leader in the church? All of this was happening right in front of him. People of diverse backgrounds were serving alongside Saul as elders in the church and were even functioning as prophets and teachers. It was a revelation of the new man in Christ not from one blood or one nation, but from many. It was a radical idea. Now listen to this. And it was from this revelation that he got in Antioch that he would later write. Listen to this, Galatians 3, 26 to 28 from the New Living Translation. For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. How did he know that? He lived it, he breathed it, he rubbed elbows with it in Antioch. This insight is one of the core foundational truths of the New Testament, but it is doubtful Paul would have ever understood that if he had gone to Jerusalem. He had to be placed in the environment at Antioch in order to be equipped to be prepared and to get that revelation. And do you know what? There are some revelations you'll only get by being in the right place. 
Isn't that amazing? Mm. That's amazing. Now, I said in last night's home group that some people talk about the black church, the white church, the Russian church, the American church, the Gentile church, the Gentile church, the Jewish church. But really, if you understand scripture, there's no such thing as any of that. Mm -hmm. Now, we've really had to deal with this in Moscow. We have a Russian speaking church, but there's really no such thing as a Russian church. And in our church, we have, Paul, I think it's 50 or 60 different nationalities. We have people from all kinds of different nationalities. And as people from different people groups kind of get, sometimes, sometimes there's some prejudice in church. Our identity in Christ is more important than our national identity. It should super pass all of our previous understandings about a certain people group or a certain nationality or a certain skin color. It's our identity in Christ that unites us. That is what unites us. And when we understand that we can serve the Lord together. Absolutely. You know, when the conflict began several years ago between Russia and Ukraine, we heard a little rumbling in our church between the Russians and the Ukrainians. I wouldn't permit it in our church. I said, leave it outside the door. I don't care what your political position is. When you come in this church, leave it out the door. We are not a Russian church. We are not a Ukrainian church. We are the church. We have a new constitution. It's called the Bible. Bible. We have a new spirit. It's called the Holy Spirit. We have one blood. It's called the blood of Jesus. Leave everything else outside the door. And you know what? Our church really is such a marvelous blend. We do have one language because it's common. Everybody can use it. But our church has uh, uh, somebody raised in America as a pastor. We have staff members from every imaginable country you can imagine in the Soviet Union. We've got black people in our church. We have an ambassador who attends our church, a black man from Africa. It is the most beautiful thing, him and his family. This black ambassador drives up to our church in his embassy vehicle, comes in, takes off his jacket, puts on an usher's jacket and serves as an usher in our church. It is just the most beautiful thing. And we have such a celebration of nations in our church. Mm -hmm. And in our church, we have been very intentional about all of those distinctions disappearing. They disappear. We once had somebody leave our church over the conflict and all the sanctions between America and Russia. In fact, I have to tell you, (laughs) being neutral and just being kingdom minded, It's been a very intentional thing for us because we have people saying, well, your country in America is doing this against us and Ukraine's doing this. We've had to be very intentional to say, you know what? We are not here to represent a political persuasion. We are here because we are the kingdom of God. And we had somebody leave our church because I was raised in America. They say, it's an American church. You know what? We don't do hardly anything American in our church. Mm -hmm. If you compare the way we run our church, the way most American churches our man is, we're very different. Yes. And we're really not run like a Russian church. No. We just kind of operate as we believe the Word of God commands. Yes. Is that true, Paul? It's true. Every church has its own culture. You have to accept that. Every single church has its own culture. And that's okay. Very connected to the city. It's very connected to the pastor. It's very connected to the founder of the church, to the things that have been established in that church, very, very connected to those things. And every church should have its own culture. That's, that's wonderful. It's part of the beauty of the church. All churches are different. But the church is a place where the Word of God should be spoken. Mm-hmm. Nothing else but the Word of God. And even when we're pressured and tempted and expected to speak on subjects besides the Word of God, we're silent. And we're not just silent. We don't even joke about it. Maybe other people have that assignment, but we do not. Yes. I I don't want to say anything negative about somebody else has a different assignment. Mm -hmm. But for us, we've had to be very intentional because we have so many flavors in our church to be the full color tapestry that God wants us to be and not one tapestry dominate. I'll tell you something that's funny to me. This family who left our church in Moscow because they said it was an American church run by an American pastor. At the very same time, we had some American preachers come preach in our church. You know what the Americans said to me? 
I have never seen a church run like this. I don't know if you could run a church like this in America. <laughs> now, I know you're probably wondering, well, what is so different? Well, we just have our own flavor. We really believe in authority, submission to authority, sticking with the Word of God. We're very, very orderly in our church, but we make room for every color and every flavor in our church. We celebrate it. For years, we had a holiday that we called... International Day. International Day, when everybody came to church wearing costumes from their various countries. I loved International Day. It was a blast. And everybody even brought food from all their countries. It was like a smorgasbord of the world, wasn't it, Denise? It was. It was so fun. I, I mean, I have some American Indian in me, and I even got to wear Indian costume. But that's who the body of Christ is supposed to be. Well, when Paul was placed in Antioch, which he would have never naturally chosen, remember, Barnabas brought him there. Oh, I'd like to say something about Barnabas and Saul, sure. or Paul. They were very different people. Very. Barnabas most likely was there for Pentecost, was there to experience the beginning of the church. Paul at that same time was persecuting the church. Yeah, he was. They came from very different, not just uh, family backgrounds. They came from very different church backgrounds. And even inside of the church, they could have had prejudice against each other. Oh, there were, there were prejudice problems in Jerusalem between the Greeks and the Jews. We read about that in Acts chapter 6. But in Antioch, the, the, there was not prejudice problems. That's why the Holy Spirit got so excited. In Acts 13, verse 1, let's look at it. It says, now, that word now, the Greek word day, emphatically, categorically, wow, now, listen to this. God did something in Antioch that was just amazing. And there in Antioch was Barnabas, a non-religious Jew who was a businessman. Simeon called Niger, a black man, probably a slave. Lucius of Cyrene, Lucius means light or bright colored, probably most scholars say a light colored black man who had been integrated into a Roman culture. Manian, who was Roman, who was pagan and was royal and Saul, the only one theologically trained. This church was filled with all these colors, languages, cultures, and it was while Paul was there that he got this revelation. Listen. Galatians 3.23. Uh, hey, are you listening to me, home group? I'm about to read to you a verse which, when Paul wrote it, would have been considered revolutionary. I use that word revolutionary very intentionally. This was a revolutionary statement. Listen to this. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. Let's look at this. Neither Jew nor Greek. These were two worlds that did not connect. They stayed away from each other. Neither bond nor free. Bond would refer to those that were born into slavery. And if you were born into slavery, you were slave. Your generations were slave unless they were given freedom. It was a permanent condition. Slaves and free did not sit at the same table together. Neither male nor female. Ay, ay, ay. That is an amazing revelation. In fact, I'm going to tell you, if you want to know who's the greatest liberator of all time, except for Jesus, it would be the Apostle Paul. He said there's neither male nor fail or female. He says in Christ, even gender disappears. For you're all one in Christ Jesus. Then in Colossians 3, 11, he adds, listen to this one. Where there is neither Jew nor Greek. So he says the distinctions between the Jewish world and the Gentile world. It disappears in Jesus. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision. That's just another way of saying Jew nor Greek. Then he says barbarian or Scythian. <laughs> and you find that there was even prejudice among barbarians. Barbarians would say, hey, we may be barbarians, but we're not Scythians. It's amazing. Every group wants to believe there's somebody worse than them. Well, what was a Scythian? A Scythian was considered to be the lowest level barbarian. They lived in what today is considered lower Russia. It would be Ukraine, Kazakhstan. That area was called Scythia. 
and they were considered to be the worst of all barbarians. So barbarians said, we may be barbarians, but hey, there's somebody even worse than us. We are not Scythians. Everybody's pitted against somebody, it seems, with a prejudice. Then he adds, bond nor free, bond nor free. But he says, but Christ is all and in all. So in these verses, Paul says there's no such thing in Christ as a Jew or a Gentile. That doesn't mean that naturally you're not, but in Christ, these things disappear. Bond nor free, circumcised nor uncircumcised, male nor female. That opens a whole conversation. I have a series which you can order on our website called Can Women Be Used in the Ministry? You need to listen to it. It'll be a revelation to you. He says that there is neither Scythian nor barbarian, bond nor free. All of these things in Jesus Christ disappear. They disappear. That's amazing. How could Paul write those verses? How did he know that? By being in the right place at the right time. When God plopped him in Antioch and he lived there for about eight years, every day he rubbed elbows with black men that were in the ministry. He was serving with Manian, a pagan Roman who was raised to despise Jews. This was just unthinkable. Rubbing elbows with it, breathing the atmosphere of it, seeing them speak in tongues just like him, the Holy Spirit moving them just like the Holy Spirit moved in him. He saw irrefutably that the body of Christ was more than just his little Jewish world. God had expanded the borders. And that was the revelation he needed because he was called to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Gentiles. If he had not had that, as part of his foundation, he could have never launched out to do his ministry. He had a revelation of it, but when he came to Antioch, he saw it, he got a relationship with it. He worked out his revelation and it enabled him to take the gospel to every color of the world, believing that the gospel was the same and the blood of Jesus and the working of the Holy Spirit was the same for everybody. And he got all of that by being in the right place. At the right time. At the right time. Wow. We're out of time right now. It's been good, but we're going to come back tomorrow night and continue. It's going to be great tomorrow night. But sleep well. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed this teaching, please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it.